Good morning and welcome to the house of the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today we rejoice because, well, we're alive. <laughs> That's what we've got today. We continue on through the summer. It's getting hot. Uh, maybe that feels a little bit miserable. You want to be outside. You want to be with friends. And maybe we're limited still. And so it's a difficult time for many of us but also a time to rejoice because God is still on his throne. Uh, today we gather and we will be looking at, uh, continuing in our summer series, looking at the Old Testament prophets, looking specifically today at Obadiah, where the pride of Edom turns to shame. Just thought I'd throw that in there for you, a little entertainment uh, regarding this prophet Obadiah. You know, someone had commented that working through these prophets is a little bit rough. They are. Sometimes the message we need to hear is not easy on the ears, but we need to hear it anyway. And so as we gather virtually today, we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing our opening hymn.
God of our salvation, we falter before the demands of your word and turn away from your call to life. Pour out your mercy on us as you showed mercy to your people of old, that we may turn from our sinfulness and walk the path of self-emptying love made known in Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture for today is Obadiah verses 15 through 21. And if you want to pause this video, then you could do that and go ahead and read all of Obadiah or maybe verses 1 through 14 ahead of time. I'm just going to share 15 through the end of the book. The day of the Lord is near. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. For as you have drunk at my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow and shall be as though they had never been. But in Mount Zion there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau stubble. They shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor for the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. So those of the Negev shall possess Mount Esau, and those of the Shephelah shall possess the land of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of this host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad shall possess the cities of the Negev. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. This is the word of our God. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like to apologize on wearing a t-shirt today, and it's not even that great of a one. <laughs> um, kind of scrambling to put this together this weekend, but uh, I think the message is still a good one if you will just forgive the messenger's garb for today. We're going to look at, at Obadiah and the whole thing. Uh, we're not going to focus on any one particular verse because it's a little tricky to unpack them verse by verse in this format. Um, but we'll be looking at how, when family hurts, because Obadiah is a prophecy about uh, or directed toward the, the people of Edom and the people of Israel, and they're related. Today, we live in a world of ists. I want to say that just S-T-S, -S, like greatest, fastest, biggest, or even best or first. And to achieve those things, we have to switch places with somebody. In God's kingdom, he switches with us when Jesus suffered hell and we instead inherit the glories of heaven. In our study of Obadiah today, we will see how one switch started several generations of revenge, pride, and shame between Two fam families of two brothers who should have been allies and not enemies. Obadiah is another book that doesn't get much airtime. It's short, tucked away between Amos and Jonah in the Old Testament, and is written to deal with Israel's relationship with Edom. And really, it's a story that goes further back in the to the time of Jacob and Esau twin brothers born to Isaac and Rebekah. The issue between the two of them was one of birthright. Esau traded his oldest son rights to Jacob. Jacob and family would go on to become the Israelites. God would rename him, uh, rename Jacob Israel, while Esau's family became the Edomites. God chose one of them to demonstrate to the world who he is, or to reveal to the world who he is, and nothing would, nothing would stand in the way of him accomplishing his purposes. So Obadiah comes on the scene as a prophet to speak against the Edomites, 
And there's not a lot of words of, of grace or mercy in this particular prophecy. So he speaks against the Edomites who have done nothing but interfere with or try to interfere with God's plans for revealing to the world who he is. Numbers chapter 20 verses 14 through 21 gives us a little of the history between these two uh, family groups. And here, Edom refused passage to Israel through their land. This is after Israel had uh, escaped from Egypt, started wandering through the wilderness, and here they're going to come up and through the land, just south of the Dead Sea area. And Moses seeks, uh, seeks an audience with their king, and this is years after Jacob and Esau were gone, Moses appealed to the king of Edom. He says, thus says your brother Israel. So the recognition that there is a relationship there or that there should be is definitely present. They, they know that they are related and what their history is. And uh, the interaction between Moses and the king, uh, the king of Edom said, you shall not pass through lest I come out with the sword against you. Uh, Moses tries to wrangle a deal here, but the king just said, You shall not pass through. And Edom came out against them with a large army and with a strong force. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory, so Israel turned away from him. There's a strain in the relationship. And uh, it's sometimes difficult to figure out exactly why that is. But between the two, there was an understood, supposed kinship there. But instead, the Edomites gloated when bad things happened to Israel. Obadiah 14 is the accusation against Edom for rounding up any escapees and handing them over to the enemy when Babylon conquered Judah and led the Israelites into captivity. And that's what's going on at the time of Obadiah's prophecy. The people of the southern kingdom of Judah were being led away into captivity, and Edom or the Edomites are standing by and, and watching and mocking or gloating. Uh, Obadiah 14 says, Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. There were some, as they were being led away into captivity, managed to escape. And instead of helping them, the Edomites rounded them up and turned them back over to Babylon into captivity. This isn't how brothers are supposed to act. In fact, Jacob and Esau had reconciled before going their separate ways. There was some animosity there. Jacob was afraid of Esau, but they figured it out and they had reconciled. Uh, Jacob ended up living in Canaan, and Esau lived in the mountains of Seir to the southeast, like I said, just below uh, or sort of south of the Sea of uh, the Dead Sea. But a few generations later, things had changed, and the brothers' descendants were divided. Edom, uh, this is some paraphrasing from Obadiah here, Edom stands aloof, Edom gloats, Edom mocks Israel instead of getting his brothers back when the Babylonians come around. Some of our greatest joys today and deepest hurts come from those who are closest to us. I think we can relate to the, the strain in the relationship between Jacob and Esau or the Israelites and the Edomites. And when you expect a brother or a relative or a close friend even to have your back, or to speak up for you, defend you in some way, and, and they don't. That's where the greatest hurts come from. The deepest emotional wounds come from those who are family, whether it's biological, spiritual, family in the church perhaps, or family-like friendships with neighbors or coworkers or teammates. There's no greater relational pain than being betrayed by a close friend or family member, but it happens. Why does it happen? The short answer is that there is sinful pride. It's the thing that makes you think about yourself and put yourself first. In verse 3, Obadiah plainly declares what is the deepest cause of Edom's betrayal of his brother. It says, The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock in your lofty dwelling 
who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? So the pride of your heart has deceived you. That's the reason. And to use the language of Romans 12, verse 3, the nation of Edom has thought more highly of itself than it ought to have thought. And in being impressed with himself, he looked down upon Israel. Or perhaps in wanting to look comparatively stronger, he took delight in the weakening of his brother. Um, if you're like me, then uh, you look for ways to connect some of these Old Testament passages or anything in the scriptures to something that you relate to in life. And I'm 46 years old. I've watched movies all my life, and so I, I like to uh, think of it in, in these terms. So here, I think that there's really a strong connection to Disney's The Lion King and the status of the two lion brothers, Mufasa and Scar. So when Scar, you have to know something about the Lion King to get all of this reference, but when Scar sings about the fall of the current regime under, the, under Mufasa, he says, pay attention. My words are a matter of pride. He's plotting the overthrow and he is exactly right. His words are a matter of pride, his own pride thinking of himself and considering himself more so than another. Pride is the cause of Edom's evil against his brother. We don't always think of pride as one of those sins that affects other people too much. We might think of it like, well, pride damages my own ability to give of myself, my time, talents, and treasures, because it's because or unless it benefits me somehow. So when we think of pride turning inward, we, we think of, well, it really only hurts me in terms of, of giving. But Edom's pride, as well as our own, also causes us to use others as step stools to put ourselves up just a little bit higher than the other. And the truth is, if we can learn from this story of, of Edom and, and Jacob, or Edom and, and Israel, if we can do this to family, we can do this to anyone. So when we see the hurt or our, our role in it and causing it, when we see that, we need to start repairing things at home, preparing us for life outside of the home. So we work on reconciliation within our family first. This is not an easy task. And it's one that we can do without submitting to God's ways and, and being filled up with God's Holy Spirit and his gifts of love and mercy. When Jesus came into the world, he was sent to Israel to begin reparations at home with his own people to show and teach what sacrificial reconciliation looks like so that the world would know. In Matthew 15, verse 24, Jesus is speaking with a woman from another region, and she's begging Jesus to help her. And he tells her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And it's true. He's of the line of David, was born in Judea, and ministers first to the people who live there. But the woman argues further, and Jesus eventually commends her and grants her her request. That story has always seemed odd to me. It sounds weird to hear Jesus the one who loves the whole world, to be so specific and seemingly exclusive. But I think in that one encounter, Jesus demonstrates the true connection to his kingdom is one of faith, not of birthright. He, under, he undoes Edom's pride in occupying the high places and Israel's complacency as sons of Abraham. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus dismisses the worldly notions of greatest and least, the first and the last. For us, instead of jockeying for a position of highest, best, greatest, or first, God's people are called to consider others more significant than ourselves. Philippians 2 verse 3 says, Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. God's kingdom is just that different, and it will be established. The death of Christ on the cross has delivered us from sin and hell, and the same death 
has defeated Satan and all of God's enemies. God's justice both rescues and reduces to wrong. And there, in the presence of our enemies, the table is prepared. We have nothing to fear because God is with us. His rod and staff of justice, they comfort us. My brothers and sisters in Christ, beloved of the Lord, today may we swallow our pride and let our cups overflow with peace and hope. In the name and the Spirit of Jesus, amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for all that you reveal in your creation so that our lives may be fruitful. Reveal your wisdom and strength among people everywhere so that death and destruction do not have their way, but your will, your love, your mercy shall prevail. Let our age learn that power belongs to you and not to men, and that you will at last fulfill all your promises of good. Your day of justice and holiness will break in, and all misery will be removed through your great mercy. Be present and carry out your will wherever there is misfortune, and may your will be done. Amen. Father God, we, uh, we come before you today asking that, uh, that you would make your presence known with your people in many and various ways. We especially lift up Charlie Doms, who is undergoing a battle with cancer, had surgery this last week and is recovering at the hospital. Continue to, to be with him and make your presence known in his life. Be with Candace Beltran uh, as she is con concerned about her health and pregnancy and as her due date draws near. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would be with her as well as her husband, Luis, and her family, those who, who care, care about her from her church family and extended friends. Lord, surround her with love and be with both of these people, Lord. They are our brother and sister in Christ. Open our hearts to, to go out to them, and to care for them in their times of need. Lord, as we consider our relationships, our brothers and sisters in this world, uh, that are that are blood related those that are connected to us in other ways help us to again swallow our pride to not be so hasty to lift ourselves up or to get ahead of one another strengthen the relationships that we have with our with our family and friends but also on a on a church level we have different churches that meet in different groups around this community. Help us to strive toward working together and for loving one another as we seek to serve and worship you in this life. Lord, remember us now in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We sing our closing song.
this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. His body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, and up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine. And before uh, we let you go for the for our time this morning or today, maybe even this week. I don't know when you watch this thing. Uh, an encouragement for to prepare for next Sunday, uh, July fifth. And next week we are looking at Habakkuk, and that is how you pronounce it, by the way. Uh, as a child, I was Habakkuk and maybe a few other things, but Habakkuk. And we're looking at all three chapters. If you would like to prepare ahead. Until next week, then, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.